Hello, Susan. How's it going with you? I'm oh, good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. You know, trying to keep warm. I guess we're getting like sort of like a winter uh, weather throughout the country, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I realize I've got my slam dance background on, which I don't need. But if it looks okay, I guess I could leave it. I don't know. What do you think? It's fine. It, it doesn't matter to us okay. because the talking to you is what's important. <laughs> Okay, good. Where are you located? Where are you? Sitting? I'm actually in California. Oh, me too. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm in Central California. I'm right, not in Southern, not in Northern, but right in the middle. <laughs> oh. Okay, good. My mom lives in San Luis Obispo. Oh, really? Oh, excellent, excellent. So, hey, Susan. Hey, congratulations on your documentary, uh, "Bad Attitude." Thank you. Thank you. So, tell us. Since you have your background on, how does it feel that your documentary is being showcased at Slam Dance this year? I'm really excited to have Bad Attitude uh, about my late husband, the cartoonist Spain Rodriguez at Slam Dance, because it really feels like the major platforms for streaming are getting more and more corporate. And when I look at what's a Slam Dance, I see what's independent film, really. Yeah, it is amazing because it, a documentary like this is fitting for sort of like a out of the box a film festival like Slam Dance. <laughs> yeah, it's really perfect because Spain was really, you know, it was part of the underground. I don't think people even, the word underground, I don't know if it has any meaning anymore, but it once had a meaning. It should have a meaning now when everything becomes more and more mainstream. That's, that's true. So at which point you decided that you wanted to do a documentary on your late husband in Spain? I started, I made a short film about Spain um, before he died in uh, 2012, which played at, he had a big retrospective of his work at the Birchfield Penny Arts Center in Buffalo, New York. Uh, but it wasn't unfortunately until after he died that I felt like I just had to make a film about him. In a way I had to figure out what I thought I had to grapple with, he's a very controversial figure and his art is, is controversial. And I had to grapple with that. And the only way I could do that is to just make a movie. So when you try to create a narrative of, of Spain, how did you want to carefully approach it? Because he's, he's not, you know, a typical regular figure in the comic book world. He, you know, he, he's very, how could you say, very unique and very, could be divisive some in, in certain areas. So you knew him the best. How did you want to portray that story? Right. It was, it was very difficult to figure out how to portray Spain um, because I am a feminist and he did a lot of work that a lot of feminists find objectionable. And yet, so I had to grapple with that. And also Spain and I have a daughter. She's in her thirties now. She's an animator and arts educator in New York. And I had to ask her a bit to grapple with his legacy. He also had a very divided legacy. He was one of the pioneers in underground comics, but he was also one of the figures in the Latino arts movement in San Francisco in the Mission District in the 1970s. So there were these two very different stories that we had to fit into the film. It, it, it is quite unique because uh, it, I, I watched the documentary and his life went for from a sort of like a rebellious, anti-fascist, you know, um, person. And then all of a sudden he was in San Francisco creating murals, showing, you know, the good, good side of him uh, in, in the community. So did, since you knew him for a long time, was it because he changed a lot or he, he was always that person? I think he changed a little bit. I think becoming a father really changed him. But I also think he changed with the times, though he didn't want to admit it. I think he was really changed by the feminist movement. And I think um, he changed with the environment as well. He, he was born in Buffalo, New York. There was a very small Spanish community there. He identified very much with being Spanish. He named himself Spain. Then he went to New York City and he had to grapple with the Lower East Side in the Puerto Rican community there. Then he came out to California. And I know some of the wonderful people that are in the film, 
I don't think she talks about it in the film, but um, um, Yolanda Lopez, you know, talked about how he seems such like an East Coast person and he really didn't get the, the California scene, but he did eventually get it. It did change him. Now for those, you mentioned a couple of times, for those who don't know, Mm-hmm. What exactly is underground comics? Because, uh, because you know, for myself, I've been to Comic Cons, you know, many times, and we see all the mainstream things. And when I, when when I was watching your documentary, I was like, oh, okay, so this this is like the comics, like out of the alternative section that's hidden away, <laughs> you know, in the corner of a convention center or something like that. But uh, exactly, what is underground comics to you? Well, it's really great you asked that because. I went, after Spain died, he uh, received the Eisner Award, which is the highest award in comics. And it was presented at the San Diego Comic Con. And so I went to receive it for him. And if any of you know, I mean, the comics world, the Comic Con, it's this enormous thing. Not only the comics world now includes above ground comics, which have come to dominate the movie industry, but it includes just about everything of popular culture has sort of merged with comics. And then, as you say, in this tiny corner, there's the undergrounds. But I have to say, I went first went to Comic Con when it was just one room in an old broken down hotel in, in San Diego. And underground comics, you know, it's hard to see how they led to all this. But in fact, I mean, it's a wonderful story because comics are an American medium. They were invented here in the USA, Uh, but as a children's medium mostly. And it was underground comics in the 1960s that first said, we can do this for adults. This can be an adult medium. It can have sex and violence and politics and adult themes and art and be literature. And it was because of that that we now have the graphic novels we have today, that we now have alternative comics. Well, obviously, uh, Spain had a great influence of on comics today, which which is which is a great thing, as is as is showcased in your documentary. You also showcased uh, some of uh, Spain's uh, you know colleagues and so on. Were they? easy to convince and to be interviewed uh, for your documentary? Because it seems like everybody had great things to say. Yeah, it was wonderful to be able to include some of the really luminaries in comics these days. Um, Robert Crumb, uh, Art Spiegelman, who won the Pulitzer Prize for Mouse, um, Ed Pisker, who's a really young, rising um, uh, cartoonist who did uh, hip hop uh, family album, who also did X-Men, um, Trina Robbins, Aileen Kaminsky Key Crumb. They all, I mean, I was very fortunate they all wanted to be in the film. And, I, and that was a lot because um, Spain was everybody's best friend. In a lot of ways, he was very central uh, to everybody. Oh, yeah. I, he, he's, you know what? I, I would have loved to met, meet him because he, he seems like a, a great, unique guy. In, in fact, he's probably very fun to be around, in fact. So um, you featured a lot of his artwork um, through here. Was it hard to obtain that? And were some of the artwork never seen before? Yeah, I think uh, some of the art in the film hasn't been seen before. I'm very fortunate uh, to have a lot of, a a large collection of Spain's art and um, with some assistance We worked very hard while we made the film also to create a massive database of his art and to store it all and protect it. But I think the display of the art in the film is a lot due to Noel Honig, who is a New York based um, motion designer and animator who figured out how to show Spain's art in the film. Because that was very hard because comics, as you know, one of the problems is comics are a vertical medium and Film is a horizontal medium. And mm-hmm. so we really struggled to how to show things well without chopping things up. Do you feel uh, by by using this basically turning into like a motion comic created a better, better narrative of, of the story for us, Spain? Yeah, we, we struggle with that. I mean, some pieces of his work are full on animated. Other pieces, there's just motion on it. Other pieces, they are just displayed statically. Um, 
And part of that was the thinking that Noel Holnig, the designer, came up with that if we're displaying something, if we're telling a story, then we need to move on it. If we're showing it as an artifact, as something hanging on the wall in a museum, then we don't move on it. Wow. I, 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 do, I do love the artwork. I wish it was a, maybe someday you'll uh, compile it into a book on display and for people to actually all enjoy it all, all at one place. Who knows, right? I should give a plug. No, um, actually Fantagraphics, which is the major alternative comics publisher, is in the middle of doing a five volume collective works of Spain's. So you can go to fantagraphics.com. They've just come out with book number three. So it's huge. Uh, they are publishing all of his works. And we are also hoping that there'll be a show of Spain's work in New York City in the Venus over Manhattan Gallery in 2022. Oh, wow. That is certainly excellent news. Now, um, one of the things that uh, you did throughout the entire d documentary was to humanize Spain's with his, you know, with his videos and so on. Were they like home videos that you just had um, around an archive or you actually had to search some of the stuff? I had some home videos. Of course, I wish I had shot more. I mean, don't we all? Everyone go out there, film you, the people you love because you never have enough. And then there were others that I spent a long time tracking down. And we had many sad stories. I had tracked down this Dutch documentary film made in the, in the 60s in New York of underground cartoonists. And they had a digital record of it and they had lost the film. So we had all sorts of adventures of trying to find scraps of film that were shot you know, back, back in the day. Susan, I'm curious. What was Spain like when you first was introduced to him? Yeah, he was, um, well, he was always a character. I have to confess, I was going with another guy uh, who was a cartoonist in the underground comics world. And he took me to a party and the comics parties in the 1970s in San Francisco were really great. It was at Gilbert Shelton of the fabulous Furry Freak Brothers house. And my then boyfriend and I had gotten, I was a journalist, I'd gotten an, an assignment from a New York publication to write about underground comics. And my boyfriend said, okay, here's the big dogs. He pointed them out at the party, you have to go up. And these are the people you need to interview. So I went and interviewed Spain. And at that time he had a 1950 Buick. It was just, you know, this gorgeous car. And he drove me home and asked me out. And I said, no, because I had this other boyfriend. <laughs> I wasn't a total skank. And um, yeah, then I continued with the boyfriend and uh, Spain actually married somebody else. And then at some point I broke up with the boyfriend, Spain got divorced from his wife and we ran into each other um, at some political event having to do with Central America in San Francisco. And then we just got together. I, I, I found it funny. It was because despite the controversy in feminism, I, I, I found it is that maybe in um, his personality is that he's actually a charmer. He's actually uh, very well likable. Is it? And that's why a lot of people do actually do like him. He was, he was very charming and he was not some, he wasn't sleazy. You know, I have to say that um, I am a feminist. I'm supporter of the Me Too movement. To my knowledge, nothing like that has ever come up about him. He didn't have to do that. You know, he had relationships with women that he wanted and he didn't treat women in a sleazy way. So he had many women friends he had many younger women cartoonists that he mentored and um, people liked him, women liked him and felt that he had, the, that he, that he had their back. Absolutely. Now, you also featured his daughter, Nora, um, through in the documentary. Could you talk about uh, her and using her animation, featuring her animation into this documentary? Yes, well, you know, there is Nora, the wonderful daughter of Spain and I, and um, she is an animator. She's also a museum educator. She creates audio programming for various museums uh, in New York City. She lives in Brooklyn, uh, but she does wonderful animation. Um, 
And it was a real treat to get to use her animation in the film and also have a wonderful film, a wonderful moment, a scene in the film where she's getting really kind of a master class in drawing from her father. That, that was a, certainly a beautiful moment, um, I, I do have to admit. Now, um, as I'm starting to wrap things up, when audiences check out Bad Attitude, what is the one most important takeaway that you hope that uh, audiences would walk away with? Mm, that's such a great question. Um, one takeaway. I want them to be inspired. I think that's why I always make films. I think that if they stay with this film, I think it's an inspiring film, inspiring to make art, inspiring to try to make social change. Um, and also just inspiring to be who you are, even if it's controversial and inspiring for us to be able to not be so hard on ourselves, not be so hard on each other, to be able to talk about uh, our differences uh, and have some faith that we can work things through. That's an excellent answer. I am certain a lot of people will get that message. But uh, one more thing before I let you go, Susan. Obviously, we're living in crazy times right now. How are you staying sane and creative during times like this? Uh, that is really a good question. Um, I think every, I think I got to say, I'm really enjoying this interview with you. I oh, think I when I make a connection with someone I don't know, somebody new and just meet a nice person whether it's a connection like this or any little connection we have, that is really buoying me up because the humdrum can become really humdrum. Well, hey, you know what? I enjoyed connecting with you too. You made my day. Thank you, Susan. I really appreciate, I really appreciate this conversation and I can't wait everything to open up and maybe we'll meet up at a Comic-Con someday. That would be really nice. I really appreciate it. It'd be nice to see you. Absolutely. Next time. Bye now, Susan. Okay. Bye.